Hello and welcome back inside the Park for May for podcast number 813. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. Yes, a.k.a. Negative Camber. You know why I've asked you here. You must convince the villagers that I'm harmless. That's exactly what I need you to do. Tonight, for your kind consideration, we're going to cover F1 news, of course. And there is some news to talk about. I know sometimes you think, oh, it's off season. What are we going to talk about? Oh, boy. Are we going to talk about some stuff? Before I do that, though, I have to bring in the co-host. You know where you love her. All the way on the right coast of our nation, nestled in our nation's capital, applying her skills as a master statistician and a dreamer of dreams and a doer of things. You know her. You love her. The lovely, the redoubtable. Grace! Grace, how you doing? I better get some better dreams if I'm the dreamer of dreams. Yeah, you got to take down that dream catcher, man. Yeah, man. I got to work on that. Yeah, you do. I'm, I'm something. I don't know. Dreamer <sighs> of dreams, though. Sounds like a pretty big deal. Build a film. It is. Behold, here cometh the dreamer. What shall become of her dreams? Mm. I know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I better get on that, I guess. Yeah, I know. Well, sp- you know, a lot of thwarted dreams this week in Formula One news. Uh, you know, fair enough. You know. Mm. Mm. Some things happened. We're going to cover it. Thankfully, some stuff happened. I mean, I know. I know. Otherwise, I, I don't know. Had today not happened, what would we have talked about? I don't know. The FIA prize giving gala. Yes, that's yeah. that. That would not fill an hour and a half of a podcast, though. No, but for all our international listeners, it's always a difficult. The, the name is always difficult for us to process in our heads. Prize giving, yes. It's it's a FIA prize giving gala, which I'm sure is lost in translation. So over right. here we have award ceremony. Right. You know, where we give out awards, right? But a prize giving thing, I'm sure it's translation of French to English. But anyway. Well I mean um, but I think I think also I mean I think it's true to tell you too. It's like these luxuriously beautiful sounding words. And then as Americans we just make it as plain language as possible, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You get some awards. Great. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No. Over here, it's trophy night. Yeah, ex- exactly. That's what I'm saying. Trophy right? so night. Great. It's, whereas, you know, the, the, the French and the Italians have this, although German also is like a very literal language. So yes. it's whatever. that's what it is. Yes. Get awards. It's one giant word <laughs> with like 27 characters, but it just means get award tonight. And it's yeah. one German word. Or it'd be like gold plated metal night. Yes, it's very yes. engineering minded. You're right, right. It's a very, very literal like that. So, to, which was to, great to promulgate that stereotype. I don't know. I learned it. I think, I think that's a fair. It is a very like, which oh, I, wickedly, was helpful. Wickedly good at that. It's very, it's a very straightforward. Makes it a little bit easier than like, oh, this fancy stuff that you know yes. makes the French language uh, the beautiful language it is. Oui. The prize giving ceremony. The prize giving gala. gala. Yes, it's a gala. And they give out prizes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I always give it's like prize doesn't quite do it justice in the American language. Like right. if you were to say like an Academy Award would be an award like the Oscar or whatever, it'd be the award for best actor or best actress or best you know, uh, right. supporting actress or supporting actor, whatever. But winning a world championship, you get a prize. That's, That's in it. America, getting a prize is something you win at a carnival. I was going to say it's what you get out of the Cracker Jack box when we were children. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a prize. You get a prize. Right, right, right. You throw the little hoops over the bottlenecks at a carnival and you get a prize. Right. Right. So, yeah. it's uh, th- So, anyway, if there always seems like a disconnect or you see a bunch of Yankees moaning on about how silly prize giving gala is, that's why. It's because it, it's, it's a language it. thing. Yeah. It's fine. But I'm not going to get into the prize giving gala just yet. I'm going to keep <laughs> our powder yet. dry. Okay. We'll hand out the the prizes later um, in the uh, right. Todd's No Shit headlines. So, Grace, I happen God. to be going. <laughs> yes. Yes. I what's happen up? to. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Grace? <laughs> How's it going? Long time no right. I haven't yeah, talked to you in a week. What have you been doing? I, man? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely yeah. nothing. Nothing. I know. Just working, man. Working, as always. Yeah. For another uh, week. Another week. Just another week. Um, so, I happen to be plowing through the Formula One news uh, cycle this past week, and I stumbled upon 
a delightfully written piece by the the redoubtable, I might borrow the term, uh, Mr. Noble, Jonathan Noble over at Motorsport.com. I'll, I'll share. I'll, I'll approve Will that. you share it with John? I will share John that. and I are like this. You know, we're on a first name basis, you know. He calls me Todd. I call him John. That's right. Yeah. I'll allow John it. and I are like this. We're, we're tight. We're not. I don't know Jonathan. Oh, I've never okay. met him. I'm sure he's a delightfully effervescent guy. Um, but anyway, very nice article that he wrote um, over at Motorsport at motorsport.com. So anyway, um, I thought we'd talk about it. All it's right. all about what did F1 get right this year? That's so, not fun. I know. You know, for you and I, if we were going to have a story, we'd say, what did F1 get wrong? Right? That's right. That's where That's the fun, fun is. That's where the fun is, right? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, All Jonathan, right. taking the high road, unlike that's, us. That's why he's the professional journalist, and we're just two yokels on YouTube, right? There you go. That's exactly right. That's why Jonathan's a pro, yeah. and that's why he makes millions of dollars crafting, wordsmithing, I might add, Prose flows from his pen like polywogs. He's uh, he's that That's kind right. of guy. So anyway, I'm pretty sure he doesn't have decorative penguins though. So whatever. heck no, That's or right. the Burj Khalifa of cat trees. No, he doesn't have that either. Yeah. No. Um. So he wrote a piece. I was reading it. Um. And it's all about what F1 got right with the regulations. So right. with the departure of Ross Braun from F1, now he's walking away, as we've mentioned in the last couple of mm -hmm. podcasts. Maybe it's time to look back at 2022 regulation changes and discuss their efficacy and the impact that they had on the sport. At least that's what Jonathan Noble did over at Motorsport. And it was a very interesting uh, read, very insightful, too. Uh, right. So I, I would recommend you go check that out. If asked, I think most people, not all, just most people that I've seen comment uh, and talk to, feel that the regulations changes did improve the racing i think so and ability for cars to follow closer uh but as mr noble says the season wasn't without its troubles and he's right he's right um as always jonathan yo john um so anyway when asked when asked to rate the success of the new rules on a scale of 10, one being poorest, 10 being the worst, best, right? Worst to 10 being the best. Uh, okay. Ross Braun said it was an eight or nine. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but there, you and I are already going to pump the brakes a little bit, aren't we? Well, I mean, but he wrote them. I mean, like, if I wrote them, I'd be like, well, you know, there's a 10. They're, they're a low nine. Yeah, maybe you know? mid nine. Yeah, right. I, I get it. I get it. I Ross worked Braun. my butt off on that. Exactly. They're almost a 10. That's so right. anyway, yeah, so he said eight or nine. All right, fine. Uh, and he said that uh, much of the early season issues that we were seeing were really on the teams, not on the regulations. Right? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's a great, uh, Ross, such such a professional. That's a great so... response. So good. My my rules were a nine. Your execution of them was four. a four. Yeah. <laughs> no, four. Yeah. Eh, it's not on me, man. So here's what Ross said. Quote, because I have a lot of quotes in this uh, this okay. week's podcast. So bear with me because I'm going to be reading a lot of stuff. And oh, again, I like it when you read. Yeah. I know. It's nice. And hat tip uh, uh, again to Jonathan Noble, motorsport.com. Go over there, check this full story out because there's a lot of other comments that I don't uh, uh, quote here. Um, it's a quote, I think a couple of things we moved on probably retrospectively we wouldn't have done. If you remember, there was a period when the teams were claiming that the rules were too restrictive and the cars would look all, all look the same. As a consequence of that, under pressure, we loosened up a little bit and we gave more freedom on various areas. But the consequences of that was that we got exploited. But that's Formula One, you know, and that's going to happen, end quote. This is some dad logic. This is great. It is. It is, isn't it? It's just great. Now, having said that, look, he's right, right, Grace? You know, you, you, you've you lived through a lot of these things where yeah. they come out with regulations, regulated changes. You've been through several regulation changes. I've been through a, yeah. a, a bunch of regulation changes. I mean, he's right. F1 has a rich and innovative history of exploiting the regulations. That's from job flexi floors to flexi wings to the j dampers uh okay. mercedes fans will know remember the frick system the dos system um the fan car fan the fans 
Uh, Williams fans will recall the water cool break, so called. Um, and you all, if you're new to Formula One, you may not know this one uh, the F duct. What is the F duct? Well, that became DRS. Um, so. I just love, I wish Ross Brown would have been like, you know, guys, uh, you know, bend the rules. That's kind of what you do, you know, like yeah, I kind like of did in one of the world diffuser. Whatever. Yeah. So the dual diffuser on Ross Braun's uh, when he on the uh, Braun GP team, right? He had I may know something about these. I uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Who better to see? And this is the thing. I'm I'm a little surprised at the comment because who can out exploit Formula One better than Ross Braun? I know that's that's you know? that's why it's like. And Ross Braun has that delivery where there's yeah. no irony in his speak. You know, he's just right. saying these things, and like if you didn't know. You know, if you didn't know who Ross Brown was, you're like, oh, you know, right? Yeah. Teams mm -hmm. do that. I can like, see what that happened. We're just not going to mention the fact that he himself did that, right? Yeah. Like, very successfully. We're and just pretty not much wrote the book on it. Yeah. You're right. We're not going right. to mention that. It's Even fine. all the way back to the controversial era at Benetton when many say that they were flouting the regulations. So, and that was all Ross Brown, my, my he, he's, he doesn't know what you're talking about. Whatever. Yeah. So it's anyway. in the past. Yeah. So, a lot of those things have really pushed the limits of the regulations yeah. and how the teams uh, interpret the regulations as stated in black and white. And then they really try to reinterpret or interpret it in a way that gives them elastic advantage. Um, yeah. And, and it, you know, and, and it's worked uh, many times uh, before. I think the, the J dampers uh, Renault had was a perfect example. When they took those away mid-year, they just, you know, performance seriously dropped um so the biggest focus on the new regulation change it was really centered around early on the porpoising effect right yeah uh and and the return to ground effect so we knew we were going back to regulations that had a lot more ground effect and then we came out of the box in australia um or bahrain and and um uh, all the early races, and then we had this porpoising, uh, quite a bit of porpoising. Um, and this is what he said about that. Ross said, quote, I think obviously porpoising was a bigger issue than we anticipated. Uh, a ground effect car, by definition, can porpoise because of the very concept. And those of us who experienced that years ago probably were more aware of how you should approach those things. And Adrian, meaning Adrian Newey in particular, I don't think their car hardly had any issues. We all know that with a ground effect car, you can't run you can't run it rock solid close to the ground. It's just too critical. Um, and I think some of the teams got sucked in, excuse the pun, to seeing how much performance there was if you ran the car close to the ground and as hard as possible. But in the real world, you couldn't do that. Then they were stuck because they designed a car to operate in that regime. And it was quite difficult to move out of it, especially as they saw the performance loss they got from moving out of that, uh, which they didn't want to give up. But I think they've all found a good compromise now. We haven't changed the rules, and there's very little porpoising going on now. So that was a bit of a hiccup with the start, and that was a bit of a distraction, which is a shame. Now, this is an interesting point because, Grace, this is what he's talking about, that really that's on the teams. I mean, it was just all a, knew it was that just, you were going to ground effects. It was just a bit of a hiccup. I don't know what the big deal was. Yeah. Well, it, He's saying, hey, you know you're going to ground effects. Your aerodynamicist should have known that. And, you know, Adrian, who had been around the block a few times, he knew it. You know, he didn't design it uh, to suffer that bad. Mercedes rolled the dice and really went all in on it, and they struggled all season long. I love right? it. And he's saying, you know, that's on the teams. The regulations didn't change. Not only is it dad logic, but he also even worked in a dad joke. <laughs> good job, no, Ross. No Braun. pun intended. All uh, right, way to go. No. Isn't that good? That was yeah. good. That was good, Ross. Brown. We won't it miss that. Good. I know. I, yeah, he would. Yeah. Um, so, on one sense of it, you say, okay, well, they had this ground effects. The the aerodynamics aerodynamicist probably should have known that. I'm sure they did know that. Right how things work in a, in a wind tunnel and how things work in real life can sometimes be a little different. Just ask Red Bull. 
Right, right. Of course they knew it. No, you know, they just thought, oh, you know, we'll just design this car that'll have porpoising and it'll be fine. Like, of course that's not what happened. They thought it was going to work, right? Like nobody they did think. plans a project and says, oh, it might fail. It's going to fail. Whatever. We'll be fine. Yeah. I give it a nine. It'll be okay. <laughs> I give it a nine. That's, that's right. That's not what anybody does. So clearly they thought it was going to work. Right. Yeah. Mercedes must have said, you know, our design with new ground effects, I'd give it an eight or nine. Easily. Easily, right? Mid nine. Totally. Yeah, mid nine. Hands yeah. down. So, and that's why I, I, in my notes, I have this part. I mean, there, look, there has to be numerous permutations as to why, but, you know, he's implying this, but could it be as simple as gambling on a design that resulted in too much bouncing? And when they raised the car to minimize that, the performance loss was too significant to ignore. So they couldn't just raise it. Yeah. Um, and we talked about it at the time during the season, you know, with Mercedes and when it was reaching sort of critical mass, this conversation, you know, so much so that, that Toto was wanting to make an immediate, you know, in-season change. And a lot of people said, just raise the damn car. Yeah. And, and then that's the obvious thing. Um, there certainly seemed to be uh issues certainly with mercedes largely and ferrari and mclaren to be fair as yeah. well as others to a lesser degree if any was going to get it right you have to think adrian knew he was going to nail it um yeah and i think I, I, oh, go ahead i was just going to say all these things have a knock-on effect right mm -hmm. i mean we always you know in my field right you worry that once you program the questionnaire you always worry about changing a question because then you have to go through and test the whole thing because you change one thing over here and it makes some mess up in the skip mm -hmm. pattern way over here right and so you, you try not to make a lot of changes because all these things have some cascading effect and unless you go through all the skip logic sometimes you can miss something so right you know right yeah raise it i mean right that's easy for us to say but all of these things are related it's kind of just like well just get a different engine mid-year well it doesn't work like that right engines right. are different sizes you can't just drop in any engine and the cars are designed around a specific en engine so right I, you know i don't understand crap i'm not an engineer so yeah i might say yeah just raise it but you know that's never going to be it's never going to be that easy yeah i mean it wasn't a realistic i mean to be fair to mercedes just saying and i understand the critics are saying all right well you're poor person raise your car and they said well we lose too much for it well tough you missed the whole thing well mm -mm. okay but wait a minute that's there's you know there's something in between there and that's what they yeah found. they they may have they may have missed it they may have gotten too aggressive i think i'm i'm not sure anything new i think toto himself said that but you know, just simply saying, we'll ratchet it up another, you know, five inches and deal with it because you missed it, right? Yeah, it's a problem, but they have to think long term in this chassis design and what they're going to do and how do they get to the end of the season and can they, you know, perfect it and bring in upgrades. And there's a lot going on there uh, to try to solve. And so it's not quite as simple. And, and I say that with the same, you know, defense of Mercedes because, you know, Okay, so they got aggressive. They tried a, a, a concept that on paper and in wind tunnel and CFD really did seem to be innovative, right. cutting edge, might give them an advantage. They were probably pushing the envelope, uh, but in reality with the track, with the weather, the humidity, all those kind of things, it was doing a lot of bouncing and other teams mm -hmm. were too. But for Mercedes, they rolled the dice, they missed it raising the back end i guess to to ross's point it does seem like and they worked their tails off they did get on top of much of it by the end of the season and they were competitive you know uh, george won in brazil right so right. um yeah and that was always going to be track flattered uh certain tracks were mm -hmm. going to flatter the mercedes more than others so in defense of that but it's the same you know it's the same notion i was arguing when when red bull was having all the reliabilities and problems with renault and everybody was like tough you know you know that's you know tough you know throw throw a different engine uh -huh. well that's no you, that doesn't work and mm -hmm. it's it's hard to be that harsh uh when you're suffering a bunch of dnfs that's that's not you know you're doing it's a difficult situation yeah i guess i also think right there's a difference between you know me the joe schmo saying that versus you know 
I, I, I think of like when we talked about like Halo or any other safety device, like I may say, I think it's stupid. Why would you do it? But somebody at each of these teams actually looks at that data and actually yeah, understands yeah, yeah. these things and actually is like, no, this will save lives, right? I don't yeah. have to understand that. But somebody at each of these teams, multiple people probably in each of these teams has signed off on this idea that, yes, this is a good idea and it will save more lives yeah. than it'll hurt, right? So it's that same idea. Like, yeah, yeah it's yeah. easy for me to armchair it and be like, oh, I don't know why yeah. I should just put some stays on it and raise it. Of course, right. I'm not an engineer, but as long as the teams, you know, which of course they do think more about this and put more thought into this, that's what really matters. I just enjoy throwing, you know, throwing some crap at people. That's really what Twitter yeah. does best. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. You know, sure. right? Like I'm not here to have some like, well, if you were an engineer, well, people people say things all the time, you know? Yeah. It's different. Yeah. It's a different yeah. perspective. I it is. It is. And I try to have deference for what they're going through and the challenges they were having, which I think they recovered sure. incredibly well sure. from uh, by the end of the season. I think Mercedes and most of the teams, yeah. to, to, to be honest, I think McLaren struggled quite a bit. And I think they, oh, they kind of got on top. Yeah. They kind of got around it. They but... kind of got on top of it. But anyway, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what develops in the next year and what their designs and, and in particular, it'll be interesting to see if if mercedes i mean if you're all in on that zero size zero you know side pod boy you hate to have the egg on your face and come back without it but it'll be interesting I mean, to see if they could continue with that concept if it'll work or not i don't know we'll see sometimes you win sometimes you lose right yeah so exactly you just yeah. try to win more than you lose but yeah if you got to go I, back to having a normal side pod and then be competitive and win races i would imagine toto go back to a normal side pod. yeah but. you know it could it could be there have been worse designs over the last yeah, few yeah. years so yeah oh yeah, yeah. mclaren <laughs> namely they had a car that was stillborn and never raced yes i try not to think about the kimmy reichen in years yeah. so yeah, it was, yeah it was right a, right it was a rough time for tough. all of us um yeah well the so, other thing go ahead no i was just gonna say oh. i think that I, I i think that right of course that's what ross Brown's gonna say i think there is there's truth to both sides right you know but at some point the teams do their best and you don't seat time is seat time right you don't know yeah, until right. you push it out there and you hope for the best right. and you go oh we missed that or oh yeah we shouldn't have done that or you see the other team's car and you go oh we should have done that you know so yeah. i don't know that's true in every aspect of life but certainly the engineers know what they're doing and they aren't just like sitting on their haunches like I don't know. We'll just throw this out there and see what's happening. That's yeah, they didn't throw a dart at it. Right. No, they didn't throw a dart at it. Although it is interesting and it's incredible how much of the car can be designed and tested in CFD and then wind tunnel work. Yeah. And you know, and design a really good car, you know, a la Red Bull, you know, or, yeah. or Mercedes in the past eight years. But uh, but boy, the rubber hits the road and there's nothing like you testing. Know, I think to Ross Brown's credit, I do think the fact that you had multiple you know they said he, here's your box that you have to build your yeah. car in and yep. you got multiple ways that people build cars that is what you really want from a set of rules right that you see yeah yeah, yeah. you aren't so especially in formula one right where it's not very yep. spec you know you don't want to be so prescriptive that everybody's car looks the same and right. so i think that so i think to me if i was ross braun i would i would feel good about the fact that you know you saw you know three or four designs out there and you know they kind of morph throughout the year that's what you would look for that's what you would hope yeah. for in a new set of rules to yeah, not yeah. just everybody shows up with the same car and everybody's great out of the box and that's not going to help that's not really going to make for good racing so i right. think in that sense it is an eight or a nine yeah yeah right and then they, what about the ability to follow closely now this was something that they were really i mean this do. is a big deal right right yeah it was one of the key goals really mm -hmm. of this massive change yeah. um and not only was it a massive change it was massively expensive to make this change and it was a massive effort on part of all the teams yeah. to make these regulation changes whenever you make a a wholesale regulation change in formula one all new cars and they couldn't even rely on the 13 inch wheels any more because those changed so right. you had all of these changes from the you know it's a white sheet of paper from the ground up different wheel sizes all new aerodynamics uh you know front wing rear wing sizes weight everything is is radically changed in a lot of ways um but the intent was to allow these cars to follow closer together because the right. traditional thought was in the past, and it's very true, they, the teams had so much dirty air coming off the back of the cars, nobody could possibly follow very well or make any effort to try to pass. So to that end, um, it, 
I mean, it helped, but it certainly didn't negate the apparent need for DRS. And perhaps one way you can tell yeah. that it did help uh, is that in a few races during the season, the DRS, quite honestly, was too powerful, right? Right. So whereas in the past, the common criticism was, well, man, you know, they need a DRS zone longer, you know, because it was just a, you know, processional circus and the DRS wasn't strong enough that should have a longer DRS zone, she had more detection points or more DRS. This was common, what you would hear in the past eight, 10 years. Right. Uh, but now um, there were moments where I was watching the race thinking, wow, that DRS is actually too powerful now. So I would say that's one way you could tell that yes they could follow closer but there were still issues and here's what ross said about that he said quote we all think about back to back talking about back to back front to back racing where there's a car leading and a car behind it trailing right um so he says we all think about back to back but what we hadn't anticipated until we started doing the work and we created the models where we could run two cars in proximity to each other is how much impact being side by side had. So those scenarios where you see a driver trying to hold a tight line in a corner and a guy comes alongside him and he drifts out, he's lost downforce. As soon as that car gets alongside him, he loses, he's losing grip. And we hadn't anticipated that scenario so much. It's really a, a, you know, a, a challenge, I think, in that that's an interesting conundrum that I'm a little surprised Ross and Pat Simmons didn't have an answer for. Um, because, and it's almost like you could, in hindsight, and that's why I like this article that Jonathan did, because in hindsight, if I think back now, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill here, but I kind of feel like, Gosh, you know, I kind of see some of that where we thought, you know, they were much closer together and all that stuff. But then there was a lot of that side by side where cars would wash out. They're going into turns, yeah. you know, drifted out. I think of um, uh, Lewis had a moment like that. Several people had a, lo a moment like that. Lewis being one of the more high profile and Max or whoever. Um, but going in and then drifting out uh, a little bit or losing that downforce side by side. So that's kind of interesting. And yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that's always one of the biggest, biggest problems, right? Catching yeah. is one thing. Passing is another, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, it's just kind of interesting um, that it, I guess through all of that, you could run closer, mm -hmm. but side by side, there's a loss of downforce. Right. And that means that if you did the math, you'd say, well, yes, if you could follow, and then you had a DRS, a very strong DRS zone, you could quickly get around and not suffer from that loss side by side, the shorter DRS zones. So I would think really going into next year, it would seem to me that either the FI or F F1 would take a long look at the races this season, the DRS zones this season, the amount of passes and what kind of passes they were, and then try to calculate what adjustments need to be made at the DRS zones on all the tracks in order to either not be too powerful or be powerful enough to spice up the show as they want. I mean, to. I think, I guess, I think at the end of the day, what you really want is you want the end of the truly train, right? Or yeah. the Alonzo train as it is now, right? Right, so, Grace, because this year it was now it was called the DRS train, right? Right. And it happened numerous times. So that's, that's always the goal. That's mm -hmm. what you're trying to eliminate is that, yeah. you know, you just get stuck behind somebody and you can't pass them. And right. it just becomes a whole line of cars, you know, the Alonso train. Right. Nobody wants that. Right. So. Yeah, we saw that several times this year, usually in the midfield. Mm -hmm. And it was usually, like you said, like an Alonso yeah. or you'd get uh, Pierre Gasly or something like that uh, or Ocon mm -hmm. or something in the midfield that was holding up a whole string of cars and they're all in a DRS train and nobody can really get by. And right. that's something they want to take a look at, I think. Well, because DRS was supposed to eliminate the truly train, and now that's we just right. have a different kind of truly train, it's a right? DRS train, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, uh, I think that that's um, always been the holy the holy grail of what they're trying to do with the rules is get yeah. rid of that that midfield train, where it's just like you can't get past them, and yeah. 
it's not very exciting to watch. So yeah, I agree, and it's something they need to solve because that midfield is where you would expect a lot of passing. That's the action, right? Because yeah. you you expect you know the 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 people up front usually are you know that front pack is so far away, and they're not they're more risk adverse, right? They're, this is a marathon, not a race. But you get to those mid pack team, and suddenly it's like. I'm Pierre Gasly. This is today. This is this race. It isn't yeah, right. a marathon to him or somebody like in that position. So, right. Um, right. Or no con. So it's a little more spicy in the mid pack just because they're more willing to take risks. Whereas, you know, you know, in Australia, Lewis is like, yeah, you know, I still got 85 races this season. I'm yeah. not going to risk it, you know, but right. You know, Alex right. Albon may not get 85 more races. He may get right. two. So yeah. he's going to make hay while the sun's shining. Right. Well, it's, I mean, it, like I said, it's a really nice article and I'd recommend uh, you reading it because there are more points that Ross makes uh, and they're definitely worth understanding it. Uh, but in closing, Ross said this, he said, quote, I think it's been a great success. And I think to me, what's important is that the principle now has been endorsed and should now be very high, if not at the top of the list of any future rule changes, which is how raceable are these cars? I think we've seen that both anecdotally on track and the objectively and uh, and objectively on the data. Uh, even this the skeptics that were and there were some skeptics about whether this was worthwhile. They've put their hands up and said no, definitely much better than it was. Yeah, in, in I quote. think that's true. Uh, and I, think I would agree with that. I think I think all in all. Uh, did it solve all of uh, F1's ills and the things we'd like to no. see? No. Did it help? Yes. yes. Should that be the design, the regulatory focus on car design going forward should always first and foremost, well, the FI, they're going to first form is safety, but, but first and foremost, the raceability of these cars, right? Right. It really should be the mission to always define those regulations with a key to raceability and would this uh, impact the car's ability to race each other, right? Um, yeah, you're right. Like step one, you know, level one is nobody dies. Level two yes. is I'm gonna watch this every week. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, and it shouldn't take somebody possibly dying to make me watch, right? That is correct. Oh, yeah. no, that's, right. like, yeah. I don't, right. I don't I don't know. That's, that's super. And I think yeah. in any sport, I mean, even though in like basketball, people don't usually die. It's so I don't need to see that. Or, yeah. you know, I accidentally catch an ESPN clip after a football game. I'm like, Oh God, kid, you need to like have those warnings. Like some viewers may be sensitive to the video footage you're about to show. Like, Oh God. No. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, do I want to see this? I didn't mean to accidentally yeah. see that. So yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that if you don't it's have... like Bria Tori in a, yeah. But I, I do, I do while we're at it, like, so if nobody dies is one and it's worth watching is two, it's actually a sport and not just entertainment is like two a, yeah, like, <laughs> right. Like this is legitimate is real close right. to, I want to watch it as opposed to this is WWE wrestling and right, it's not right. real. Right. It's so not real. Yeah. I think that that ties in real close to the, I want to watch it because to make it. I want to watch it and it's WWE. That's a lot easier than I want to watch it. And this is a legitimate sport. Yeah, so for sure. Keep that in mind, people. But I agree. I think, right. and I also think before we move on to the next topic, it's Ross Braun. I mean, I joked for, you know, years that it was like, Ross Braun, you're our only hope. So it's <laughs> That's like, right. if Ross Braun it, couldn't come up with something good, I felt we were sunk. So I'm yeah, glad that yeah. Ross Braun was able to come up with something that, you know, I don't know if I'd say it's an eight or nine, maybe a seven or eight, but yeah. you know, Fair enough. I think that I think he came in and he really shook it up. And I think that it'll be interesting to see how these um, rules kind of shake out on top of the fact that, you know, we had the whole pandemic and that pushed the rules back and, you know, yeah. it was a bit messy there um, for two years. But uh, right. I so I think I think Ross Braun can go, you know, fishing and not worry about, you know, Formula One anymore. I he agree. Did his, he did his job. He paid his dues twice now. He's good. Go fishing. Yeah. Go fishing, man. All Unless right. Gonna, let's see. Unless you want to come back to McLaren, and then you should stop fishing and come to McLaren. <laughs> or Ferrari. Oh, you know, whatever. Getting the team back together, man. <laughs> um, anyway. Get Massa, get, get Jean Todd. We'll, we'll just, you know. Speaking of openings, let's talk about Williams, <gasps> shall we? Let's do. Goodness. <sighs> this is sad. Sad news. I hate to be the guy to reveal this if you haven't read this news already. Yost Capito 
That's right. Our friend, Yost Capito, former VW uh, dude, is out as team boss over at Williams. Yes. You know, that's, yeah, that's, uh, well, let me, let me just read through this and then I'll share my thoughts. That's okay. your quote for this. That's, um, that should be the, the tagline for tomorrow's podcast YouTube mm. clip. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Uh, ahead of the 2023 FIA Formula One World Championship season, Williams Racing announces that after two years at the helm of the Grove-based outfit as CEO and team principal, Yos Capito is stepping aside. Technical director FX, is that right? De Maison yes. will leave his post after joining in 2021. Williams Racing will announce its new team principal, technical director, due course. Here, then, is what young Yost had to say. Quote, it's been a huge privilege to lead Williams Racing for the last two seasons and to lay the foundations for the turnaround of this great team. I look forward to watching the team as it continues on its path to future success, end quote. Well, that doesn't sound like a comment written for him. <laughs> uh, chairman of Doralton Capital, Matthew Savage. Talk about Savage. He's right. This is Savage. Uh, quote, we'd like to thank Yost for his hard work and dedication as we embarked on a major transformation process to begin the journey of reviving Williams Racing. We're grateful that Yost postponed his planned retirement to take on this challenge and now he'll pass the reins on for a next part of this staged process. We would also like to thank FX for his contribution and wish him all the best for his future as he moves on. End quote. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, At this maybe. point, I, um, hmm. Well, I, I read all that. I was kind of like, okay. All right. So that's unfortunate. I hate to see that happen. But I'll tell you the funniest part of all this, if there's anything funny about it, has been reading everyone's comments about this. So I've read that he's leaving. And, and you know, they're enterprising people kind of just thinking what could possibly happen. Why could they possibly do this? So I give him an A for, you know, just creative thinking. You know, some have said, hey, you know, maybe he's leaving now because he's going to have gardening leave. So if he leaves now, covers gardening leave, you know, he came from VW. So he could be leaving now, serving a year of gardening leave, and then come back when VW Audi comes to uh, Formula One in 2025 to lead that team. All right. Don't think that's going to happen. I but, don't either, you know, but I, I like appreciate it. I like where you're going with that one. That is, I, uh, I do too. I like the creative. I appreciate thinking. the thought. Yeah. I like it. And uh, that's fun to think yeah. about that. I've read a lot of fun things like, okay. yeah, he's going over to Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, okay. I no. just want to say, <laughs> no. If you thought, like, if you thought, but not, not you, but the people at Ferrari who, you know, pushed out Bonato or Bonato didn't want to work with either anymore was like, oh, you know, that guy, he's, he's, He's too like engineering, right? Like he's yeah. too nerdy. He's too in the books. Yos Capito is literally the opposite of that. So <laughs> I do, I love the messiness of Yos Capito going to for, I agree. It's not going to happen, but <laughs> in my mind, I just, that just, uh, that would be delicious. Go work at Ferrari. No. Oh my God. They no. lose it for sure. <laughs> As a Ferrari fan, let's say we don't. Yeah. Come on. Um, it it would be so messy. I I'm just here for that. That would be great. Yeah. You know that stuff I, earlier that I said about that I want the sport to be legitimate. This is not. Yeah. This is the opposite of that. <laughs> I just want it to be messy and right. I enjoy that. Yeah. So just go Yos and uh work at Ferrari, be their team principal. That'd yeah. I think I read that and I was like <laughs> Yeah, no. no. As a Ferrari fan, no. But I did get a big kick out of this saying, "Aha, Bonato to Williams." But, hey, I don't think I, he would do that, but yeah, that's fine. No, I like the idea of Fred Vassour. Like, somebody overheard him talking about, like, oh, he's leaving. Did you hear that Fred was leaving? And somebody jumped to Fred was going to Ferrari, right? In that same sort of, like, connect the dots, yeah. Capito is going to Audi kind of way, right? Like, oh, 
Fred used to work with Charles. Oh, he must be going to Ferrite. <sighs> Joke's on you. He's actually going to Williams. Yeah. See, I, you and I could be totally wrong. I just don't know that I see Fred as a great fit at Ferrari either. I just don't see that happen. And I could be wrong, but I don't know that that would happen either. Um, uh -huh. Ultimately, I don't think many of us thought that the winter season would turn into a team boss silly season. Right. It's like the, sp like the summer break, right? Yeah, is when yeah. all the drivers go somewhere crazy. Right. And in the winter, they fire all the coaches. Yeah. yeah. You know, look, I, to be fair, it didn't tell on myself. Uh, in the end, it, it doesn't really surprise me. Last summer, I was watching a couple of interviews with him, and I was thinking he just seems kind of quirky. Uh, you know, yes. a, a very affable guy, probably definitely a guy you'd want to have as a buddy and eat dinner with and chat with. And, but he's kind of quirky, kind of goofy. Um, and I was thinking that maybe he's a little too quirky and affable to be in the shark tank that is F1, you know? Yeah. Um, and I was hoping that this would, he'd turn out to be the Ted Lasso of F1. Right. I really was. But it didn't really turn out that way. Um, so there you go. So, yeah. Grace, I guess the big question everyone's asking now, who should replace Yost at, at, at Williams? And I'll just say right now, here is a terrific opportunity for Toto Wolf to go back home. Get down. Go back <laughs> home to Williams. Take your wife with you. You go there. You go back over to Williams. Lewis could go with you. You guys could rebuild Williams and bring it back to its glory days. If anyone could pull that off, Toto and Lewis could pull that off. Oh, uh, yeah. Williams yeah, fans like, here's are diehard. They want Williams at the top. They need Williams at the top. Get, get out of here. I mean, like, yeah, we're going to send you to Williams. Be successful. Oh, right. And we're going to give you, like, 25% of the amount of money you had. Well, but Toto's a billionaire. He doesn't, you know, he's, he's doesn't need the money. No, he Why doesn't not? need the money, but the team does. What is he doing? Like, well, he's, he's a billionaire. Throw, throw a few quid in, Toto. Let's get no. Williams back to the top. Jack needs to go to college. What are you talking about? I think oh, that. It doesn't take a billionaire to be able to go to college. I don't know. I'm just saying. All right, that so I go to a state college, Jack. I mean, I don't know. That's that was fine for me. That's but what I'm just I did. Saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, just go back and go to Williams. I I don't I don't I don't see oh, that happening. I think that, I think that would be the dream of Toto and Lewis going to Williams and rebuilding that team. No way. That would be awesome. All right, fine. All right, Fred Vassour to Williams. There you go. Bonato to Williams. Um, I don't know, but the question is, Williams brought uh, Yost from the outside, right? Yes, right. Brought it from Rally, right? Right. And I could see how, like you were saying, I could see how he was successful in Rally. I think yeah, that, yeah. that kind of like mental flexibility, I guess, mm -hmm. or that like ability to be kind of out of the box and yeah, I mean, right, yeah. like the drivers are their own mechanics. Like it's kind of the yeah. opposite of yeah. uh, formula one in that sense. So right. I see where he's very successful in WRC and that just didn't translate to the way formula one operates. It's just really not kind of that same thing. Yeah. You know? And so I was just kind of wondering, will, you know, so here you have Williams who went outside of the sport, brought in someone from uh, a different uh, uh, class of motorsport. Um, didn't really work. Would they do that again? Or would they try to move somebody currently on the grid in a maybe not a team boss role, but just under the team boss or whatever and elevate someone? Is there someone within the Williams program that would step in and step up to that role? Uh, would they find former um, like Eric Bouye or remember how they used to recycle yes. Mac, Mike Gascoigne? They just, I just recycle him. You know? I was just thinking, like, give it a year, and Otmar Schnaffner will need a new Otmar, ride. yeah, exactly. Otmar's, they just recycle Otmar, He's the you new know? Mike Gascoigne, right? Yeah, so, he is like, the new Mike Gascoigne. So they just have to find somebody that will fill this for a year, and then Otmar will be open, and he can yeah. go run Williams. Right, right. It'll be fine. Right. So, um, 
I think Finbar may be still available now. You know, remember Finbar? I do remember Finbar. Finbar was awesome. Paul and I had so much. Every once I saved that picture of Finbar on the pit wall. When he's looking at the camera, he looks absolutely shell shocked. Yes. You know, and and he's just sitting there looking like I am so out of my league right now. Uh, and so every once in a while, I'll send that to Paul for a joke. We have a yes. good ha, a guff ha. So anyway, let us know who you think yes. should replace Yost Capito. Okay, poor Yost. Wish you the best, but at the you know really at the end of the day, yeah. uh, everyone's going to hear this message. Goodbye, good luck, and good riddance. There you go. I also I will he also got, he got up, Marcoed. He did. I will also open it up to who's going to be the team principal at Williams wrong answers only. I think that is equally oh, yeah. as much fun right, as like right. actual answers. So right. I'm here for the wrong answers as well. Right. Yeah, so. that would be good too. All right. All right. Moving on. Uh, let's see. Honda again. Yes. Again. So the key to, the keen eyed among you may have noticed the Honda logo on the side of the red bull from the Japanese Grand Prix onward. And as the talks with Porsche seemed to come to a, a grinding halt, I suggest at the time that it had to be that that relationship had to be perfect for Red Bull or they just reheat their Honda deal. Right. Right. Given the rumors that Honda were possibly interested in reversing their decision, you'll recall that Honda said they were leaving F1 because they wanted to focus on their electric cars and just couldn't justify an F1 program and all that internal combustion nonsense. Right. So they were going to leave because they really wanted to use all those resources and everything for their electric right. car program. Right. So that's why they were getting out, except something happened the ring did not intend drive to survive came along and the whole world went nuts for formula one and millions of people are now watching and right. magically like that honda decided oh you know what maybe we are interested in and and so they have filed with the fia that they would like to be included as a manufacturer in 2025 onward they are literally the worst boyfriend ever, aren't they? I, I'm at I'm least not Toyota has the guts to to leave and stay away. Right, right. But Honda was like, "Yeah, we should break up." Oh wait, you're dating somebody Me. else? They're stronger, Me. they're better, they're look, you know, they're smarter than mm. I am. Oh, now I'm gonna give you a call Me. and I'm gonna slide into your DMs. Hey, how's it going? What's up? Right. Worst boyfriend ever, Honda. Right, right. They were going out with F1. F1 yeah. was the employee working in the in the mail room, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, found out he inherited billions of dollars. All of a sudden, you know. F1's interested, right? That's or Honda's right. interested, right? Yeah, F1 goes to the prize giving gala, and now all of a sudden, Honda's all in it. It's all exciting. in it, man. That's it. That's Terrible. it. So, Drive Survive happens. Everybody's in it. So, this, but look, this has always been a burr under my saddle, if I'm honest, with car manufacturers. It really is. I've always been really frustrated with how fickle they can be. In 2008, mm -hmm. folks, if you're newer to Formula One, you'll this may be a surprise to you. You veterans know this. In two, and you, and you longtime veterans of of our website and podcast, and I was on a rant back then. I called BMW the um, the ultimate quitting machine. Yes. But in two, 2008, saw Honda, Toyota, and BMW all just leave. Gone. It just on, psh, gone on a dime. They said, yep, we're out. Everybody left, packed everything up with immediate effect. And they left F1 in the lurch in a real pickle. And Bernie Eccleston at the time had a heck of a lot of, of to solve with. I mean, that would be like Mercedes, Renault, and uh honda you know did or ferrari or something like that. that'd be like all three manufacturers just poof, leaving formula one right now and that happened in 2008 and that was uh that was brutal um so honda comes back gets beat up so you know they come back to formula one after they left the first time they sold their team to ross braun for a buck or a pound and he goes on to win the world championship with that car. So they got out a year right. early. 
They got out of 2008, and they said, yeah, we're done. We're out of here. You know, the the economic housing bust and the crunch can't do it. You know, they made up some reason why they right, were getting whatever. out that had nothing to do. Again, it was worst really- boyfriend. Yeah, exactly. They made up some excuse that they were, you know, it wasn't the economic crunch, the global economic crunch, 2008. So they bailed on Formula One. The very next year, Ross takes that their car, their engine, goes and wins the title in 2009 with Jensen Button. Well, they did the same damn thing here. Ah, we're out of here, man. Right. This whole internal combustion, this is a joke. You know, we're going to go make electric cars. That's what we're going to do. So they leave. They decide to get out. Good luck, Red Bull. Red Bull goes on with their engine to win the world championship. Now they're like, oh, okay. So, they, you know, after they left in 2008, they came back. They got beat up by McLaren and Ron Dennis. They got called all kinds of names. Then they end up winning a world championship with Red Bull, which we predicted, by the way, back then. We were saying when they went to McLaren and things weren't looking good, I kept saying they should leave and go to Red Bull because Red Bull is having all the challenges with Renault. And I said, if they go to Red Bull, Red Bull won't Ron Dennis them. They'll actually work with them and they'll win. And they did. Um, Then they get caught up in the whole you know, anti-ice discussions and things are going on, uh, you know, the World Economic Challenge and everything that's going on. So they decide to leave again. Now they're coming back um, in 2025 in order to capitalize on the success of F1. Now, Red Bull have a deal with Honda through, I think, 2024, 25, something like that. And then they'll have their own engine from 2025 going forward, or at least that's the plan. But the team seem open to working with Honda, and maybe just the presence of Yuki Tsunoda might suggest that might be tangible proof that they're open to working yeah. with them, right? Um, I see, re- in my mind's eye, I see Honda returning as a works team with Red Bull to work with Red Bull. Yeah. yeah and that's right. why Porsche didn't work out. I think Honda pretty much scuttled that deal with their commitment to possibly return. So I think Red Bull knew that and had that in their bargaining hand. Um, so the question then I'm trying to figure out is, so is, is, is Red Bull making its own engine? Yes. That was the intent. Right. They could see them teaming up with Honda to work on the election, uh, the electric portion of their engine, right. While Red Bull work on their ice portion of the engine. And that way everybody's happy. Um, and everybody wins. Um, at least that's my thought. But here, Grace, is what Koji Watanabe had to say All right. about it. As HRC, that's Honda, uh, we have registered as a PU manufacturer, power unit manufacturer, uh, after 2026. I had my my years off a little bit. Uh, said Watanabe during Honda's 2023 Honda Motorsports Activity Plan presentation. This is um, I had to uh, Motorsport, by the way. Um, the F1 regulations from 2026 onwards are moving in the direction of carbon neutrality. In addition, the fact that electrification is also being promoted and the carbon neutrality and electrification that Honda Motor Company is promoting is the same. The targets match. As a racing company, we have registered as a manufacturer in order to advance research on racing. There is also the fact that November 15th was the deadline for registration. We have registered as a manufacturer in order to continue this research. So there you have it. They are coming back for the electricity. Right? There you go. That was great. That's just, that is straight up bad boyfriend. Like, well, you know, you didn't really have the things we wanted, but now that you do, we're, we're ready to come back. Yeah. We're, we're in it. Yeah, we're in it. Yeah. So fickle. And I get it as manufacturers, you know, yeah, and I, and I, look, they're in, it's a business, right? And a I lot know, of this is a big but... expense and it's total. I totally understand why they all left in 2008. I get it why Honda left now. It just comes across as very fickle. That's why I tend to kind of like privateers, like Red Bull. uh, McLaren would qualify uh, because they're using a Merck engine. Williams, you know, all these uh, privateers because, um, yeah, they're not as fickle. 
I think every team would be a privateer if that was affordable, right? I don't yeah. I don't think anybody is happy with this, right? I think yeah, right. Renault over the past 10 years is a prime example of why having the manufacturers involved is not great for anybody. But yeah. nobody can afford it. Most people can't afford it otherwise. Right. So this is what you, that's what you get. But I agree. I think that there's something um especially in formula one where it's going to take more than, you know, five seconds to be yeah. successful. Right. you got to kind of be in it for a little bit longer. Right. Than, you know, Ferrari that maybe Bonato <laughs> given a few more years, you know, could have followed through right. on the promise, but they just weren't willing to wait for it. Um, but I, so I guess, I guess we, we, we mock, I think that's, yes, we mock. again, we're just some yokels on YouTube. We're not, we don't work for, you know, uh, Autosport or Razor Motor Motorsport.com right. or something like that. But Whatever it is, I I I do like the idea that it was like, oh yeah, we're gonna go. Oh, you're successful. We're back. So we're back. Here we are, and they'll make it work. <laughs> and... Just kidding. Oh my! What is this cat? Oh, my goodness. No, the cat has just figured out it's a love session with you. Apparently, everybody's yeah. just showing up. We'll see who else. Kitty's all up. on you. Hey, this quick before we get into Albin's cat. Speaking yes. of nice segue, Grace. Thanks. Uh, there's six sprint races. Those were announced. I'll tell you what they are. Uh, Austin, Baku, Spa, Qatar, Austria, and Brazil. Those are your six. All right. Let's... They should just be six at Brazil. Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. Brazil. Yeah, exactly. And Brazil. Was that Brazil. six? I don't know. Right. There right. you go. That was six. Let's see. George, 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 George. Yeah. Right. Uh, all right. Let's do some uh, Albans cats. Look at those kitties, Grace. Those lovely kitties. All right. Hit us, Grace. What do you got for Alvin's right. cats? Well, I, I do appreciate that Ziggy is polite enough to, like, hang out off camera here. It is nice of Ziggy. <laughs> Unlike Mikasa, who doesn't care. Doesn't care. Doesn't does, care. Does that during work meetings? She doesn't care. Whatever. Don't confront her. No, she wants pet, and she wants it now. She wants it now. That's right. What the heck? <laughs> You and your so, husband would, would be dead if it weren't for your opposable thumb to open the cat food. Oh, well, that is for sure true. I'm pretty sure they're Killers just Killers like, in the living room. Mm, whose nose are we going to eat first? That's mm -hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's all right. Okay, so Albon's cats. Sorry, yes. segue. I'm trying to figure out who else is going to show up, but I don't think anybody else is in here. So and who knows? We still have time. Maybe Lee Val show up. <laughs> or Flip. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, I know. He could, I, I could scratch him behind the ears. Yeah. I'm sure he'd like a little shoulder scratch, you know. Sure he would. Yeah, I'm sure he'd be okay with that. A little dry food. Yeah. A little kibble for Flip. Yeah. I mean, I make him food, too, so sure. Why not? <laughs> Although, for the record, he made dinner tonight. It's not, you know. Uh. Anyway. Anyway, an aside. So, last week, you may remember, we talked about the auto sports gala prize we did gala, right not the official fia giving we gala. did but um we talked about it so but mm -hmm. at that point i hadn't watched or it hadn't been released the actual footage from the race so like we talked about vettel having to win a side pod but i hadn't i had read it but i hadn't seen it so seeing yeah. it was much funnier that he's just like up there and he's yeah, like yeah. hold on i gotta check my phone right yeah yeah so did you watch george's interview when he won moment of the year yeah Okay, so first, I, I he tells a story about being young and meeting Ross Braun in the bathroom, and it was like, okay, right? And he's like, well, do I say something? I'm like seven, but yeah. that's, yo, that's Ross Braun, and I'm like, oh, you know, funny. But then he talks about, you know, because David Coulthard's there. So he asked David Coulthard about when he won the award, and David Coulthard goes, oh, I won it in 1989. And George very quickly goes, that was nine years before I was born. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, David's just like, Great. Just like all of us, when that kind of thing yeah. happens, when you're, you know, over the age of 25 and you're sort of like, thank you for pointing out that you were not born for another nine years when I won this. Right. Right. And, and you can see that, you know, George tries to recover as again, want is one always does when you're the younger person on the end of this, like you were trying to make a joke and you realize, oh God, I just called that old person really old and I didn't mean to do right. that. So then he tries to like back his way out of it by going, well, you look great for 50. And DC goes, I'm actually 51. So I think lesson learned, A, always be careful when you're the younger person talking to the older person. And number two, at least we've learned that George is very good at quick mental math. But yeah, right. I just thought that was great that he was just like, oh. Missed it by a year. 
Yeah, great. Okay. That's quick math. That was pretty good, right? So you figure yeah. that out. Um, I did also want to note, I mean, this used to also be uh, fashion awards, right? Like that yep. was always a part of this. So I would, I feel remiss to not bring this up. I did want to mention that uh, Naomi and Natalie, their outfits, they were spot on. I, I thought that, uh, you know, Natalie had this uh, great um, Louis Vuitton jumper on and Naomi had also a jumper. And I feel, I don't know, as a woman, a jumper requires you, if you have to go to the bathroom, to take the whole thing off. So there's yeah. there's some part of me that never wears a jumper because that seems like a lot of work just to wear clothes. But <laughs> I, so I, I feel that when I see a woman in my everyday life wearing a jumper, I'm always like, I'm not that brave, but right on that you wore yeah. for a whole night a jumper. And I hope I'm sure they had people helping them, but it's always a, a brave fashion choice. Yeah. Yeah. But they both looked great. So I wanted to mention that as well. And I wanted to mention that uh, Lewis Hamilton, uh, you know, of the Lewis Hamilton Fashion Awards fame. Yes. Oh, oh you're back for more. Welcome. Anyway, <laughs> Lewis Fashion Award. The new he made the New York Times uh, best dress list. So uh, what? Yeah, so that's something to something oh. to check out as well. Lewis Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton, there's no stopping him. Yeah, there's no stopping him, Grace. It's an oh man, the old Lewis Hamilton fashion award. I'm glad the music is still on the soundboard. That's excellent. It is. So so check that out. So not only did he make Vanity Fair this year, but he's also made New York Times. How best about dress. that? So Right on, Lewis Hamilton. Well, I'll tell you what he didn't make, and it was a prime opportunity, the FIA prize-giving gala. <laughs> I thought for sure he would show up. You know, he loves events like that, and he usually has some really crazy fashion, and, you know, this seemed tailor-made for him, and he was a no-show. Well, you know. Well, he had nothing, I don't know. He didn't win this year. So. Yeah, no, I get it. I know, you know. Right. But uh, so I, I wanted to give some nods to some fashion that I yes. you know, bring that up. Well um, done. I also uh, wanted to point out that I, too, when I read the Yos Caputo story, I had no idea who William's technical director was. But I do now. Francois Xavier Dimension. Yeah, it's FX. And I couldn't remember it, his name. It was like, FX what they call him, but I couldn't. That is the greatest name, name ever. FX, Francois I know. Xavier. He like, has his own TV channel too. Yeah, right. So, so then flip because uh, right as I've mentioned, we play F one manager, and when you play F one manager, you get to name you know your team principal name, right? Yes. And that he's like, oh, next time I play, I'm totally being FX to Medley. So, to me, like that was it. that's right up there with like uh, Rob S Medley as my favorite cousin, right? So yeah, if if you see FX to Medley, you'll know who it is. It's <laughs> us. But Francois <laughs> Xavier was like, like that is your, your parents did a great job. They, they should did. be commended. That is, that is some great naming right there. Sure and is. Then I did, since we are now on what, week three of Bonotto Watch, which I feel is really yeah. just like us sitting on a hillside waiting for the smoke, right? To yeah. come out like a new Pope is being named. Yeah. I vote for Dion Sanders to be the new team principal. And ah. the technical director over Ferrari. I think that would be even more fun than Yost Capito. I would really yeah. shake those people up. Yeah, it would. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. As a Ferrari fan, let's not. Again, epic messiness. I think that would be fun. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Not great let's... for the racing. No, no, let's not do that. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Yeah. All right. I got some no shit headlines. Uh, let's see. The first one up. Uh F1 star Charles Leclerc reveals he has split from stunning girlfriend Charlotte Sign and asks for privacy. <laughs> why is she stunning? Well, why do you need privacy when you broke up with a girlfriend? It's not like, like someone in the family died. I mean. Oh, I guess because she's. No, I mean, it would be like if Alex and Lily broke up, right? I think that if you follow Charles Leclerc's social media, you have a, a presence with Charlotte, right? Just well, like... everything, yes, and I get it. And that's always the trouble, right? So right. when you have people that have these uh, large platforms, be it Charles mm -hmm. or, or George or Lando or, you know, Lewis right. or whatever, mm -hmm. and when you, you're broadcasting your whole life and wonderfulness yeah. and me and my girlfriend, you know, in the bay on a boat in Monaco and here's we are in these French Alps and doing all these things. And all of a sudden you break up and you say, yeah, but we really need privacy now. It's like, 
Well, everything else wasn't so private, but you know, yeah, you got to it's hard to to want privacy after you've spent publicly posting all of this stuff out there and then to immediately want privacy, but I get it. Yeah, so I think yeah. I think that's where the privacy comes from because Charlie yeah, was, yeah. you know, featured a lot in his stuff and rightly so. I mean, I think the other Well, cuz side... she's a stunning girlfriend, it says. Well, I mean, I think, you know, even you and I, again, Yokels on a YouTube channel, you know, we talk about your your wife or we bring up Flip or something like, you know what I mean? Like, these are people I spent a lot of time with in my life. The, the stories often involve Flip. So um, I don't know. I guess it's kind of hard to just keep my life about myself and clearly my life without, you know, the four cats that live in my house that decided to be on this podcast tonight. But yeah. yeah, you know, I just, I just am always, of course, that is terrible, so misogynistic. Right. She's just a person. What? Well, yeah, okay. Why do we need so, stunning. Well, I, 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 uh, let's see. Podcast star Grace Medley reveals she has split from stunning husband Flip Medley and asked right, for privacy. Flip, Flip is stunning. Bye. Well, there you go. See. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, if it was the other way around, if she was the famous one, yeah. they would not have put a descriptor in front of Charles Leclerc. Would they have said uh, dashingly handsome Charles Leclerc? No, they wouldn't right. have. Because right. his right. worth as a as a man is not only in his beauty like it is for women. Although, well, <laughs> my daughter may argue with you on that one. No, I'm not <laughs> saying I he's feel gorgeous. that way. <laughs> he is, no, he is gorgeous. I'm not saying he's not gorgeous. I'm just saying that... If you list like a th like a list of things that Charles Leclerc is good at, being good looking is way down here. But a woman's worth socially is in how she looks. I get so what you're saying. So it's much higher although, on the list. Although his being really good looking is at the top of my daughter's list. <laughs> I, I'm fine with that, right? Yeah, That's like yeah. good hair. I'm, I'm yeah. right there with her. I'm Carlos just saying. Carlos signs. It's him or Carlos signs. They're like right there for her. You know. Right. No, I yeah. I totally agree yeah. on a micro but, yeah. level. Totally. But, yeah, you know, yeah. socially, yeah. we yeah, don't need yeah, to just yeah. describe women by how no, they I look. I agree. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Next headline. F1 fans all say the same thing as Lewis Hamilton beats Mercedes teammate George Russell pre to prestigious end-of-year award. Yep. I said that last week, too, didn't I? Yeah. Best British driver? Are you kidding me? <laughs> George Russell beat him. Hell, I argue he Randall may have too. I mean, that was he a, you got to be kidding. What? How? How? In what world? And what money score does that even equate? And I and, and the Lewis, internet went crazy over that. They're like, what? Lewis already had an award. A, B. No, it's not George, you said they gave him best moment of the year. They did, but then they gave Lewis best driver or what? Not. I mean, that went to Max. Best Stafford. British driver is a <laughs> difference. That was it. Yeah. Whatever. Best so anyway, British driver. I so I think, wasn't alone in my criticism, and everybody's like, "Oh, you go into Hamilton." So, so no, I feel like but, for for once, uh, Todd and Team LH has had some overlap in their di Venn diagram. <laughs> That's the first time that may have ever happened. Because me. You, you over here, Team LH way over here, but for yeah. once, you've all come together for this one moment. That See, I think we all agree driver that driver wasn't enough. Yeah, I think George should have had that one. Had the race win, beat him in points, pretty much had the measure. I like that as, as if Autosport, you know, is taking all of that into consideration in their prize giving, you know? Well, here's the thing. I could be wrong, and if I am, let me know. What would be the justification? They have to give, they can't just give everything to Lewis. Well... Yeah, but what would be the just what I guess? Let me ask it this way: What mm -hmm. was the justification for giving Lewis the best British driver award when he was beaten by George, who happens to also be British? George won a race, out qualified him, and and scored more points because they sat there and they said, "Which award do we want to give George? Best moment or best British driver?" And they said, "Best moment." Yeah. Well, we can't give him both. So we'll give Lewis the other one because we have to give Lewis something because this year sucked for him and he's not going to get it oh, on merit. He's a veteran. He's had bad years before. Come on. I he understand that. I, that's not the point. It's not Lewis that they're worried about. Should have gave Lewis the best moment because he had many. 
uh, from the year. He had some great passes. And this I also year. think people are also always influenced by your last race. So if George had, had a great had if Brazil had been the last ranked, race. Yeah. No, yeah. no. I mean, I mean, if George would have been successful at the beginning of the season, right, and won the sprint race and won the race, and oh my God, George, this is great. We would have all forgotten by now, eighty-five races later. But yeah. it didn't. It happened right at the end of the season. So everybody's like, that was the best moment. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. They probably just, yeah, I could see that. But you know anyway. what I mean? They they were just like, what's the best moment on the top of my memory? The top of my memory was George. Give it to George. Right. Oh, right. now what do we do about best British driver? I guess we'll give it to Lewis. Yeah, well, <sighs> anyway, I'm not alone there's, there. There's no, I agree, but I just think this is a totally like uh subjective of all subjective things well, and I, I feel like it's you know. it's it, it, honestly if i'm lewis i'm thinking mm, it, it's mm, it, it isn't really justified and if i'm lewis okay thanks for the award but really in his mind he knew george beat him i mean that's yeah, oh for sure i mean that's a reality it's like it's like in schumacher's mind rossberg beat him he had more points i just had a better year it happens you know I don't know. I just think I just think to expect that awards giving ceremonies of any any ilk are based on anything but subjective opinion is is crazy. And that's why I don't go to prize giving galas. We've never uh, been invited, but you know, true. that's it's why true. we don't go. I know. Eddie Everard didn't invite me and I don't know why. He should have. Sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't let this happen. You you know cuz you are Jean Todd's third son. It's yeah, his right. actual son, Felipe right. Massa, Todd. Right, right. Uh, this uh, this was bizarre. The FI during the FI prize giving, uh, the boss was uh, <laughs> in rare this form. Is great. Oh, Mohammed Eddie Ben Sullyam was in rare form. It was, is affectionately known as MBS, um, not to be confused with SBF. Uh, that's a whole different. That's yes. uh, FTX. Or well, yes, to be confused with FX. FTX right. would be the logo on the Mercedes car. F FBF would be the the former CEO, you know, being looked at for fraud, and MBF would be Mohammed Ben Soyem, uh, right. the president of the FIA. So MB MBS was in rare form during. I don't know if he had a Kimi moment, Punchy. like he, if he would be if he'd been kicking back proseccos all night or not. But first of all, this is the headline, FIA boss keen to avoid F1 becoming, quote, like wrestling, as he warns controversy will continue. And then I'm thinking, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You started it this year you, with the FIA yes. prize gala. I mean, can we talk about Eddie Everywhere's performance at the FIA gala? I mean, what the heck? He was he was out of control. He got into this whole argument, you know, defensive much, with Christian Horner, who made mention of the, in the points that it took him a little while to figure out that Max had actually won the championship. And boy, MBS got all offended. And, and so much so, this fellow Domenicali, who has like, no no dog in this hunt, had to go, know. okay, guys, guys, let's keep yeah. it nice. And he had to break it up. He needed the, the shepherd's hook, right? Like, yeah. Right. But it wasn't even Christian who was like arguing no. back. It was just MBS going off, you know? And it was like, yeah. dude, uh, relax a little bit. So I don't know, but this guy is. I just feel like yeah. for the first time in a year, Christian Horner went, now I see why Toto doesn't come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, he's probably thinking, ah, uh, this, yeah, I understand Toto. Now I, I understand. I I dogged yeah. you all year for everything yeah. you did, but. I get it. I yeah. get it. I won't be at next year's. No, um, this, is, this has been terrible. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, this headline, FIFS's backlash for ugly pictures of Ferrari effed it. Uh, that even embarrassed <laughs> Charles Leclerc couldn't look away from. Okay, that headline is great. That is Isn't epic. It? Let me read it again. FIA faces backlash for ugly picture of Ferrari effed it, which really, you know, spelled yeah. out. Uh, Ferrari effed it. That even embarrassed Charles Leclerc couldn't look away from. So the FIA decided they were showing the montage and the whole video and Max winning and dominating, winning the award. But anyway, Charles Leclerc, they give him his award, but they run this video montage oh that they created showing with these artistic pictures of a close-up of a horse's face, a black cavalino, and showing the, you know, then it was showing. But it didn't really show. It showed all the failures of Ferrari 
this whole season. I mean, it was really bad. Now, I know as a Ferrari fan, I'm coming across sounding very biased. and No, it was bad. Would. But guys, really, Ferrari fan, I, mean, I try to park that because I've been as critical as Ferrari as anyone. But that was bad. Especially because it's not as if they only had bad moments. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're dealing with like AlphaTauri or somebody, you know, I don't know. It just wasn't a team that, you know, it's not Williams that you're giving they this award to. They were second in the championship. I know. But so yeah. if you like, again, if you're an alien and you just showed up and you watched that and you might, you were like, well, that team sucks. That must have. You would watch that video and think that was the worst team on the grid. Right. And so. And they were second. I know. I just think there Terrible. were so many other things they could have shown. Yeah. That was I, bad. And, you know, usually. I'm just saying your goal isn't to mock, ridicule, embarrass the person you're giving the award to. Right. You know, even right. if they were Williams or some team that had just a disastrous season, you you would make it's like we joke about Drive to Survive, right? Like they make yeah. some boring ass race and we're like, did you did we watch? Did you watch the same race I did? Yeah. Right. They make it seem like, oh my God, this race was so right. epic. And you're just like didn't I think I watched this race? I don't right. remember any of this, right? Right. This is the opposite. This is it drive is. to surviving in negative, where they made yeah. a team that had a, a markably pretty successful year in balance to their pretty awful year. Yeah. And all they showed was the awfulness. And I it know, was just it was like terrible. wow. Yeah, it was, was really bad. bad. So yeah, anyway. Uh let's see. Uh do we have time for a mailbag? Yeah, we still got ten all minutes. All right. I'll squeeze it in. You've got all mail. Right. Uh, this Mr. Drury asks, says this, uh, I was idly thinking the other day as opposed to thinking gear. Uh, wait a minute. You know what that deserves. Um, about the recent Formula One resurgence and more teams wanting to join and more locations wanting to host races. I think 24 races are too many, although many are in favor of it and may think that 10 teams are enough. Uh, or And many think that 10 teams are enough, despite new interest from other parties. Basically, if there was enough interest all around, would you think that it would be, that it, would you think it tenable for there to be a split season style? Where two groups would compete against each other at different venues throughout most of the year and then get sorted near the end where a uh, the A pool uh, teams with the single drivers of the most points would compete uh, uh, for the championship and the B pool would compete uh, for best of the rest. Maybe something to eat up some minutes on the podcast. So, so like football, right? Like you have the NSC East or the yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. NSC North and then right. eventually you whittle down to the best teams out of the conferences right. and the divisions and then they right. go to the Super Bowl. Is that, is that the idea here? I guess. Except that, I mean, it, it wouldn't always be because tracks are so, I mean, stadiums, yes, yeah, stadiums are different, but short of maybe like Denver, they're really not that different yeah. um, anymore. So I think, or Green Bay in the winter or something like that, right? Like, yeah, right. You know, there's just not that much difference. Whereas the variation between tracks is huge, right? And so, um, you know, if you're McLaren, you just want to be with, in whichever pool has hungry because you're guaranteed at least one successful <laughs> race, right? Right. So, don't, right. Uh, I think that would be um, that would be interesting to know, like, how would you divvy up the tracks? Because every every car kind of is successful in different places. Um, well, I yeah, be... I think I think cost wise it wouldn't work. But uh, no, but I was just yeah. going with the like, you know, yeah, if we yeah. went down this rabbit hole on Reddit, right. what would it look like? Right. right. Not. But you could do it. I mean, even, you know, that's what they've kind of alluded to when there was you know, the B teams, right? The A teams yeah. and B teams, even within the same grid. So they were saying, well, there's the top two, maybe three teams, and then there's everybody what if, else. And... What if we split them? Yeah. So you yeah. have a Ferrari in each and a McLaren in each and a, right. you know, a Mercedes right. in each, right? Right. So there's two cars for each team. So you could take one car's group A, one car's group B, and have both races, right. both qualifying sessions, both races. There's your sprint race, right? So both races, both qualifying sessions, on a weekend, right? You have group A and yeah. group B, and then you have winners of group A, group B for the final race each other. Yeah, I, I go. Yeah, I think that would that sounds I don't that sounds interesting. I think that um, I I will add, you know we were Flip and I were talking about this this week. How many teams could you have in the series? I 
I don't actually know that answer. I mean, most of my Formula One watching, it's been, you know, 10 teams, 20 cars. Oh, well, no, there was more than that in some... the past. Yeah. No, I realize that, but I wonder too, like the cars are like there. I feel like there has to be like a, a physics way of answering that. Like, cause you're right in the, in the seventies, there were more cars, but the cars were shaped differently. So maybe now you couldn't get as many cars as a track. And yeah. would it make the most sense to go to like, how many cars could you fit at Monaco or something like that? Or like how Brazil's always weird. Cause right. Isn't it Brazil where like the back field can't see the front of the field in the in the starting because of the hill yeah right right so i just thought that was an interest that that really filled at least 20 minutes of flipping eyes conversation time was trying to figure out how many cars i mean because it started about michael andretti because you know that's love right there when your partner knows how to really get you get your push your button like what about michael andretti what about him go ahead right <laughs> let's have this conversation again but then we actually kind of were talking about how many teams could you actually now with modern cars at the modern tracks get on the grid? Yeah. 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 With well, the big, I don't see it moving beyond 10, maybe oh. adding one, but the, the reason is because nobody's going to want to split up the prize money more than they already are. Right. So, so I get that, but let's yeah. say that's not how they divvied up the money. Yeah. Then if it yeah. wasn't like, if you, if you divvied up prize money based on entry fees and teams and all that, you'd have yeah. 15 teams, you know? Right. Yeah. So I just wonder if there was an incentive, if the incentive was based on more participation, they would add more teams. And to your point, how many more could they add? Right. So I guess you have 30 cars on a grid. Right. I think there there must be some like max where like you just, it would just be a disaster. You just couldn't fit that many cars on a track. I don't know. Eddie everywhere figured out though. There you go. I thought, you know, Chain Bear could put out a video in the off season and maybe we'd have that answer, but I don't don't know. All right. Well, that does it for this podcast. That's what we think about the news, but tell us what you think about the news. You can do so at theparkforme.com. Share your opinion. Just do it with uh, decorum and civility, as always. A huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. And for those of you over the holidays throwing a little love our way, uh, we appreciate it because we could not and would not do this podcast if it was not for our Patreon supporters and those that uh, support us through PayPal. So thank you so much to all of you that do so uh, because you, and it's a select few group and you know, it ebbs and flows a little bit and it's waning a little bit. So for you that signed up uh, this month, thanks so much. I really do appreciate it because it is you and you alone that make this podcast possible. All the other people listen that's awesome. Appreciate it. Appreciate the support, spreading the love, sharing our podcast. Don't get me wrong, but it's because of the Patreon supporters that we do this and we uh, are indebted to you. Also, if you like the podcast, go over to iTunes, give us a little love over there, give us a good rating. And until next week, when we come back to do it all over again, this is Todd, AK. Wait a minute. Is next week the 19th, Grace? Yes. Isn't that the night we're planning on? Doing the beer, the wine and cheese podcast. That's right. Get your festive gear oh, going. Oh boy! Next week should be a barn burner. Next week, it, you know, cross your fingers if Paul is still able to make That's it. Right. All three of us on the cast, non F one related. We're not going to talk about any F one. So if that drives you nuts or the thought of that scares the hell out of you, don't listen. Uh, but for the rest of you, it's time to get to know Paul and Grace. And this is the podcast we've been threatening to have for 15 years. So we're hoping to have that next week, next Monday. So be sure to tune in. For six years before Enzo truly was born. That's right. Yes. Six years before Enzo was truly, truly born. So there you go. All right. Until that time, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Canvas saying so long, Grace. See you next week. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.